If I should ever leave you, whom I love, to go along the silent way, grieve not, nor speak of me with tears, but laugh and talk of me as if I were beside you there. It's astounding. Time is keating. The void is calling. Let's do the time walk again. I am a lesbian of the 21st century, a hench of the Order of Perpetual Indulgence, Edinburgh Convent, and I'd like, if I may, to take you on a strange journey back to the 1980s. The year I came out was also the first year I ever saw the word gay on the front page of a newspaper. The only reason the tabloids of my paper around were saying gay was because gay play would be a larger headline than homosexual play. We had sex education at James Gillespie's High School, which was enlightened for its time, but our sex education never mentioned lesbians and never mentioned the newly identified virus, not as HTLV or LAV or ERV. My source of information about the virus by the tabloid headlines was in the pages of Gay Scotland and by a monthly magazine I worked as a volunteer and in the safe sex leaflets being urgently produced by queer organisations to save lives. In 1986, I learned from Gay Scotland when the acronyms were all unified as HIV. And it was shortly after that, when I was 19 or 20, that a friend who also worked for Gay Scotland told me he was HIV positive. This was new to me. We hadn't had the words for it. People talked about AIDS and the virus, but if someone got the virus, they got AIDS. And unless you were particularly close to them, they disappeared from the scene. Before the words HIV positive existed, we said someone had AIDS. And then when they got sick, they had full-blown AIDS. And they disappeared. Silence equals death has more than one meaning. Eric was an innocent victim of AIDS. He became HIV positive in the most natural and innocent way possible. He got fucked in ass for mutually consensual pleasure by a man who was HIV positive and had enough of a viral load of semen transmitted to his partners. Eric died in 1992 at the age of 28. A year before he died, I went on a rant at a science fiction convention to friends, all heterosexual, all older than me, who listened with kind attention as I sermonized that we should have a safe sex stall here at this SFCOM. We should hand out condoms. No one should be having unprotected sex. But I don't think that could happen here, said one friend, kindly, similarly. After all, we only have sex with people we know. I recall exactly the helpless fuckiness of that moment as I realized that to people outside the LGBT community, no matter how kind, how intelligent, how nice, there was no comprehension of that other world I lived in, where every man I knew knew this, your dearest friend would be HIV positive, and not know it, or worse yet, have a good idea that he might be, but not to say it out loud and warn you, because then you would have to face the fact that he was going to die soon. That is how Eric got infected. His friend knew he might be infected because he'd had unprotected sex with someone else who had been tested and who knew he was infected. But Eric's friend didn't want to face this because he was afraid of dying. And he didn't get tested until he too had full blown AIDS. And then he died. There was a great push in heterosexual circles for a time to make a division between the innocent and the guilty. The children who were born HIV positive because of their IV drug using mothers, the haemophilics who became HIV positive because of blood transfusion, these were innocent. 
people who got infected by a shared needle or shared sex were guilty. And it was okay not to talk about or to help the guilty. But for those of us inside LGBT community at the time, after there was a test, before any kind of real treatment, what I remember was a complex silence of pain and fear. I knew more than one gay man who would not get tested until the NHS offering tests a drop-in centre where he could wait and get the results within hours. He was too afraid of receiving his death sentence with the post, opening an envelope and reading that he could now measure his life in a short term of years. World AIDS Day began in 1988, an effort to make heterosexual people talk about AIDS, about people living with HIV and AIDS, on at least one day of the year, to wear a red twisted ribbon, to remember and to speak of the dead and of the living, and for us too, because it's hard to tell stories when they end in death. I still wish Eric were alive with us today. I still miss him. I never want him to fade into silence. We who lived through that time saw our friends taken from us in a global pandemic that respectful people didn't talk about. Silence equals death. Let's talk about the past. Let's talk about how we, sisters, began and why World AIDS Day is important, so important to us. But let's start a couple of years ago. Patriot, April 2019, San Francisco. A wonderful sunny Sunday and a park full of smiling, happy people. And an awful lot of nuns. Um, no and the odd hedge person too, including your narrator, Circumference, and also the redoubtable Circumspec of the Porky Scratchings. All come together from all across the world for the 40th anniversary of the sisters. And the sisters came together to celebrate the things that sisters hold dear. And these are what the first sisters described as the expiation of stigmatic guilt, the promulgation of universal joy, and public manifestation through perpetual perpetration. Hmm. Yeah. The world was a very, very, very different place back in 1979. Um, for a start, nobody had seen bearded men in nuns' habits before. And apparently their arrival caused cyclists to drive into lampposts. This was even in San Francisco, the city that had seen pretty much everything. Um, these nuns, for such they were, and they are, uh, decided to use this energy for good, to take this and fight for what is right. I mean, it was the 70s after all. Um, and one of the things they started to do was to help organize fundraisers. Uh, the first one that the sisters organized were actually for gay Cuban refugees. Uh, and let's face it, refugees are as a hotter topic today as they were back then. But I'm, I'm digressing. Um, a couple of years down the line, and it's 1981. Um, over in the UK, a young lad of 14 has worked out that he's gay. Uh, yeah. He's going to have a few very, very scary years at him, and he's going to spend most of them hiding. Um, but back in San Francisco, gay people have started going down sick, 
with a new illness. It doesn't really have a name yet, but it will initially be called Grid. And finally, by the end of the next year, it will be called AIDS. Um, local organizations start to be set up, and but organizations require funds, and so the sisters were there, and the sisters were getting involved. And the first fundraiser to benefit an AIDS organization was hosted by the sisters. It was a dog show in Castro Street with Sylvester, the singer, artist, recording artist, as a judge. Um, but from then on in, things started to get very, very dark, I'm afraid. Um, in 1982, the trickle of cases became a flood. Two sisters who were also registered nurses, Sister Florence Nightmare and Sister Roz Erection, worked together with other sisters and medical professionals. And they produced a pamphlet, a pamphlet called Playfair which was the first ever Safer Sex pamphlet that was sex positive, it was practical, and it was actually funny. Oh, and one of the things that it does mention is mysterious cancers and pneumonias. One of the people who is suffering with this disease was actually Florence Nightmare herself. And in 1983, she appeared as her secular self without uh, a nun drag on, um, on the front cover of Newsweek uh, with her lover, who was euphemistically referred to as her friend. Um, she came to many to be the public face of this terrible disease. Um, this was probably one of the first times that quite a lot of people had ever heard of it. And also in that same year, the sisters organized the first AIDS candlelight vigil. Um, and those the candlelight vigils, they, they remain a fundamental, important part of what we do on our World AIDS Day. Um, and which was set up, World AIDS Day, um, as such by the World Health Organization in 1988. Uh, I mentioned that the following decade was rough. Um, the toll of death mounted, including Sister Florence Nightmare, and by the early 1990s, HIV was the number one cause of death amongst Americans between 25 and 44. Throughout all of this time, sisters were campaigning, fundraising, and generally spoiling it for everybody else. Because we had a reason. Because, as the group Outrage put it so clearly, silence equals death. However, hope was coming around the corner, first one, then two, then a number of different drugs that intercept HIV's life cycle in different ways, uh, and finally could be put together into combination therapies. The first treatments that made HIV into a chronic but livable condition. So coming back to that park in San Francisco a couple of years ago, it is a very different world today. Um, the sisters will go on fighting for the principles that we believe in, however. Or particularly on World AIDS Day, we fight for the expiation of the stigma associated with HIV. We fight that sex positivity is a universal joy that should be promulgated. And, yeah, we still public manifest and we still serve the communities that we live in. And... Also, on World AIDS Day, we light a candle. And we remember all those that came before us.
This year marks the 40th anniversary of the first clinical observance of AIDS and 38 years since we discovered the cause of AIDS, HIV. Today, through treatment, it's no longer a death sentence, but by now considered a chronic manageable disease. The majority of people are now living with HIV rather than dying of HIV. There is still a disparity in treatment around the world. Lacking medical infrastructure and cultural taboos prevent people with HIV from getting the treatment that could help them live with HIV. In 2020, 460,000 people died of HIV-related causes in Africa, compared to 45,000 in the Americas. And AIDS-related illnesses remain the leading cause of death among women aged 15 to 49 in sub-Saharan Africa. The good news is that since 2010, the number of people receiving treatment for HIV has tripled. In 2020, 27.4 million of the 37.6 million people living with HIV were on treatment, up from just 7.8 million in 2010. AIDS-related deaths have fallen by 43% since 2010 to 690,000 in 2020, and new transmissions have fallen by 30%. In the last decade, the, the emergence of tools like PrEP and TASP has also helped to limit new transmissions and shows that beating HIV works best when working towards a solution from several angles. The ongoing COVID pandemic has shown how fragile our healthcare infrastructure is worldwide. However, the pandemic also shows how much the LGBTQ plus community has learned living through almost four decades of the AIDS pandemic. 72% of all US adults have had at least one dosage of the vaccine, compared to 92% of the LGBTQ plus US adults. Knowledge is power. But there are still misconceptions alive and well concerning HIV and its transmissibility. A poll by HIV Scotland in 2020 concluded that 46% of the respondents thought that HIV can be transmitted through biting, spitting, or kissing. Only 19% were aware that people living with HIV on treatment with an undetectable level of virus cannot pass it on through sex. And a mere 9%, which strongly agree that they be comfortable with kissing a person living with HIV. Those numbers clearly indicate that we still have a long, long way to go to end the stigma experienced by people with HIV. This epidemic has been integral to the work that we do as sisters for decades now. We were there in the beginning, educating and supporting, and we're here now to support ending AIDS within the next decade. You see, a lot has changed over the years. People all over the world are now receiving effective HIV treatments, with even more treatment options in the pipeline. And global health organisations have formally stated their commitment to ending AIDS. They've actually set a really ambitious target, which is to end the AIDS epidemic by 2030. The aim was that no child would be born with HIV and that anybody already infected would be treated with medicines that give the best opportunity for healthy living. The contrast between this goal and the dark days of the 1980s and 90s, when an HIV infection was almost always fatal, is really stark. We have come such a long way since then. Today, nearly 21 million people around the world receive life-saving treatments which can reduce the amount of virus in the blood to undetectable levels, 
but it doesn't end there. You see, HIV has changed from a deadly disease to a manageable disease. So now scientists have set their sights on even greater ambitions. The current treatments have had life-changing effects on transmission rates, bringing us ever closer to that 2030 goal. And thanks to campaigns such as U equals U, which stands for undetectable equals untransmissible, the way that people understand what an HIV diagnosis means has changed, which means that people are now ready to turn their attention to the future and have hope for the future. But what does this future look like? Well, there's work taking place right now to try and develop potential vaccines, something that would revolutionise HIV as we know it. Can you even imagine? <laughs> there are even hopes for an eventual cure, although this has been harder to come by than expected due to that latent reservoir virus that stays within the body. However, the greatest potential could be offered by further development of what's known as treatment as prevention options. And researchers have been making significant progress in this area, and in particular with longer acting versions of the current treatments. You see, at the moment, the antiretroviral drugs that HIV positive people have to take in order to treat the infection have to be taken on a daily basis. And this can prove really difficult for some people. These long-acting treatments, however, are much more potent and could take the form of, say, a long-acting injection rather than daily tablets. Such treatments, therefore, help lessen the mental and emotional burden of taking HIV treatment, as the number of days that the patient would be required to medicate would drop significantly. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, on the 18th of November, 2021, NICE published draft guidance for the first time recommending the first long-acting injectable treatment for HIV infection in adults. And the UK looks poised to be able to start looking at rolling this out across the country, as do other countries around the world, with the treatment having already gone through the required approvals for use. There are similar hopes for PrEP too, which is the pre-exposure medication taken by HIV negative people in order to prevent infection. Although the World Health Organization has stated that this is still likely to be more than a year before the option becomes widely available, it is in the pipeline and it is coming to us in the future. However, it's this focus on prevention and treatment that brings that 2030 goal within reach and makes it possible to consider eliminating AIDS as a public health risk by 2030 and ultimately ending the AIDS crisis once and for all. And of course, the final key to this is continuing to tackle the stigma faced by those with an HIV positive status. The continuation of campaigns such as U equals U and spreading awareness of how treating HIV to the point where it becomes undetectable and therefore it can no longer be transmitted to others is vital in destigmatizing and demystifying HIV and will encourage more people to get tested, to know their status and therefore to be able to access these treatment options. Suffice to say, we have the tools we have the tests and we have the treatments. If we come together in solidarity and take shared responsibility, we could really do this. We could end AIDS by 2030. And the sisters are here to support you every step of the way.